Ja, velkommen hit. Uh, ja, jeg ja, gør ja, en lille introduktion på uh, skandinavisk, fordi vi skal uh, prøve at tage engelsk uh, i dag, hvor uh, jeg, hed, hedder, jeg hedder Gitte Ørskov, og jeg er ny overintendent her på Moderne Museet, har været her i seks vikker. Så jeg uh, er, er som jer, uh, ser udstillingen for første gang, Øh, og øh, er meget betaget af den, øh, og er meget stolt af den her udstilling, som stiller så mange interessante frager øh, for os. Øh, så jeg håber, at i dag, indtil at vi får svar, men at øh, frågerne åbner verden op øh, for os øh, her videre i dag. Men øh, jeg vil indtil sidst have meget andet end velkommen, og så vil jeg lemme øret ord til øh, Karin Valfest, så du vil sige lidt mere. Thank you, Gitte. Um, I will say something very, very short because I will soon leave the word over to Lars Bang Larsen. Uh, it's just a practical detail and it's, as you may know, it's, uh, the, the exhibition will open publicly tomorrow, but you will all be welcome to take a sneak peek after this talk. So just join us and uh, Uh, come up to Mad Muses and uh, yeah, you can have a sneak peek. So, uh, Lars, yeah. there you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me like this? There we are. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for coming, everyone, uh, to this artist talk. Uh, Just a brief word about the structure of this event. We will start with uh, the lecture by Nicola, Nicola Boic. Uh, Nicola will speak for about half an hour, and then we will um, we'll invite the, the panelists, uh, the artists of, uh, from the exhibition who are, who are with us tonight uh, to the panel, and then we will, uh, I, will, I will interview, <laughs> have a conversation with them for the following about 45 minutes, and after that, uh, there'll be an opportunity to, to take questions as well, uh, to ask questions to the artists. Um, we will, uh, we should leave here around 6.30-ish. So that's, that's the time frame for this. Um, I'm very happy to be able to introduce Nicola Boic uh, as, as tonight's first speaker. Um, I'm really looking forward to hear to hearing uh, Nicola speak about a very significant and extraordinary body of work that's included in Mod Muses, uh, cybernetic diagrams from the 1970s created by the architect and urbanist Branko Petrovic. It's a body of work that's been lost to history. It was meant to be presented here in Stockholm at the UN Summit on the Human Environment in 1972. The diagrams never made it to Stockholm then, so it's only now that we have the opportunity to see them. Uh, and that is thanks to Nicola's research and his work with uncovering this uh, extraordinary body of work. Uh, I'm sure Nicola is the only person in the world who can speak about this particular work. <laughs> and I'm also sure that uh, he can do it really well, so there's lots to look forward to. Nicola is uh, a designer and an art historian from Zagreb. He's, uh, he has studied and taught at Harvard and MIT. He is currently a researcher, um, a PhD student at the University of Split. And among many other things, he's dealt with public art and the technopolitics of cartography. Uh, welcome, Nicola. We're really looking forward to this. Uh, thanks for uh, introduction and thanks Lars for creating a, really such a humble, friendly and warm ambience uh, inside the exhibition space and around it, really. Thank you. Uh, and also thank, uh, thanks to Museum uh, for such a fantastic uh, production and organization of the whole event and exhibition. And uh, thanks, thanks to Damir Gamul in Gamba who helped me with, uh, with uh, diagrams, with uh, the, the graphic design. Um, 
and uh, many there are many people who who worked on on this so i want to point that out it's just not just my uh, my work um so uh my um uh, uh lecture uh, my and i have to turn uh, this spacey mic on apparently because it enables me to move around uh so uh, my um the story that i'm going to tell you today actually is uh starts in 70s for some reason uh, uh 70s were uh, early 70s specifically were uh, a, a historic period that resonated with uh, uh our contemporary moment on so many so many levels uh well, that historical period uh, was time of uh, incredible technological uh, progress. Uh, many technologies that we use commonly today were conceptualized and prototyped uh, in that period. Uh, but also it was a uh, uh, time of a great fears, fear of uh, thermonuclear war, uh, eruption of Cold War conflict, uh, uh, and also for the first time really uh, that was a time of uh, uh, environmental crisis or, or consciousness about the uh, 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 collapse of the planetary environment. So all these techno-scientific uh, innovations, trends, but also all these fears, and specifically this environmental fear that we, the fear that we're living uh, in a planet that can actually uh, disappear as we as we know it, uh, somehow were channeled uh, in '72 uh, in one specific event. Uh, at that event happened uh, in this city in Stockholm. Uh, uh, in June, if I'm not wrong, uh, and that was uh, first United Nations Conference uh, on the Human Environment. Now, <clears throat> this was really pioneering uh, event that gathered uh, uh, 133 uh, national representatives, politicians, or some uh, diplomats, actually, who discussed uh, environment and future planetary future. It was a huge political endeavor. Uh, we have... <laughs> this, this is not one, one of my slides. So... So yeah, there was a uh, there was a huge uh, political event, basically, and diplomatic event because it took a lot of effort uh, to to gather around the same table, not just different nations, but a really different worlds, um, including uh, the uh, African countries, including uh, India, for example. So this is uh, this is uh, Indira Gandhi, uh, prime Indian Prime Minister at the time, giving incredible speech about uh, uh, relations between uh, uh, poverty and environmental crisis. Uh, and of course, many African countries refused to come because uh, they felt, uh, at the first place, they refused to come because, you know, they felt uh, that Western world, finally, once they were decolonized and they, when they started developing, that Western world will superimpose uh, restrictions uh, and limitations to them, uh, to their development. So it took really a lot of uh, d diplomacy to, to gather everyone uh, to discuss the really one issue, which is the planet Earth and sustainability of our life on Earth. Uh, this effort actually uh, resulted with uh, another pioneering thing, which is a declaration uh, on the human environment, uh, on the protection of the human environment. That was the result of this uh, of this important conference. Uh, and also, Stockholm conference uh, produced a new United Nations body, United Nations uh, Environmental Program, actually, uh, that uh, served as, uh, well, <clears throat> a spine, if you like, of all, of many other uh, United Nations initiatives, including the the climate uh, change initiative, including the habitat, including uh, uh, a protocol such as uh, Kyoto Protocol, including some declarations such as 
the most recent Paris Declaration. So this historical trajectory is still very active, uh, but also it uh, had germ of uh, bureaucratic germ, uh, heavy weight, uh, actually, uh, that enabled uh, policy to really be implemented. And this logo made in 1972 uh, uh, in very interesting way uh, talks about that because you can see that human or this symbol of human and symbol of planet are two entities that are hugging each other. So we are talking about two entities, humans and environment. And second idea of this faceless human that can be anyone actually, but actually that presents this homogeneous idea of humanity is very uh, uh, unproductive because th it leads to once again to this modernist, huge modernist narrative, the grand narrative of one nation, homogeneous idea, coherence uh, and equality. A year before, before Stockholm conference in Yugoslavia, uh, there was another type of event. There was a conference uh, called future forecasting the future or predvijanje budućnosti. Uh, that was a scientific conference because forecasting the future at the time was well uh, uh, methodological or scientific pursuit. Uh, of course, it happened in a broader context of many think tanks around the world that at that time tried to forecast the future or find the proper methodology to forecast the future. And always, technology was important part of it. Uh, but this uh, this specific conference in Yugoslavia was interesting because um, uh, Yugoslavia at that, that time uh, was uh, uh, considered as a political experiment. Um, from after breaking up with Stalin uh, in uh, 1948, uh, Yugoslavia implemented uh, uh, self-management and as its main uh, political and uh, uh, economic uh, uh, mode of organization. And in 60s, this political idea of cell management uh, was mashed with the cybernetical principle of uh, self-regulation, which opened up huge space for experimentation with art and technology. And everything happened uh, and actually erupted uh, during the, uh, the New Tendencies movement, our artistic movement that actually marked the arrival of computers uh, in art. Uh, this, uh, uh, this conference uh, happened in the very peak of, of that period. Uh, and it, it gathered uh, scientists and artists from both sides of the Iron Curtain uh, discussing uh, future technology and environment. Uh, and one uh, one of the most interesting guys who presented there, actually, who opened up the the, the lecture, uh, the the conference with with his keynote speech, is Abraham Moll. Uh, he he was a, a, f a famous French cybernetician uh, who talked about uh, axi axiomatics and methodology of the future. Uh, and actually, the whole lecture was around this diagram. So for me, this is very uh, incredible diagram because um, it shows um, it shows a past. So here, here, here we have past, and here we have future. Uh, and he claimed that uh, the present moment is not a thin line that separates past and future, but he claimed that there is a certain thickness uh, of uh, of present, thickness of now. Then thickness of now is very um, unstable uh, material uh, moment, actually, material situation uh, uh, that we are immersed in. And this material situation of the, this thickness of now uh, is uh, actually in a constant uh, changes and shaped by feedback loops with the images of the future. So these black points are the images of the future. And of course, technology is very substance of, of, of these images of the future. So here and now is shaped by these images. And he, uh, he also uh, uh, claimed that because here and now is shaped by the images of the future, this type of cybernetic feedback loop is actually modus operandi of social engineering. And that's important political fact, you know. 
because it makes us to really think or to imagine uh, futures that are that would not be so f f nicely aligned along s a single timeline. Really, it makes us to 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 imagine a uh, decentralized future, explosion of of future and explosion of technologies. Uh, it makes us to really speculate about uh, indigenous futures, indigenous uh, technologies, peripheral futures, peripheral uh, technologies, uh, alternative stuff, minor stuff, invisible stuff. So the whole rant about technology uh, that Ursula Le Guin introduced as interesting uh, idea and quote and, and Lars with this exhibition uh, actually happens in this feedback loop not between uh, uh, here and now a dominant uh, uh, corporate political images of the future that are imposed uh, over us, but between here and now and alternative futures and alternative technologies. And this explosion of alternative stuff, at least as I'm concerned, is well reflected in the curatorial concept of Mad Muse's exhibition. One of the points in the exhibition uh, at the, po the, fo the focal point of my research for some time and artistic research and also theoretical research is this book. Um, it's called Systematization of the Phenomenon of the Human Environment. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a planetary vision, a, a study that was published in 1971, a year before Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment. So basically, very similar time, almost the same time, but the same topic, but the approach was radically different. Uh, instead of writing technocratic thread of text, uh, like as a collective work, uh, this study uh, is organized around 36 spectacular di diagrams that uh, connected human systems, natural systems, uh, social systems, political systems, and technological systems into one systemic overlay that was developed through 36 visual samples. Um, and also, unlike uh, Stockholm Conference, which was very collective endeavor, uh, this was product of a single man. Uh, his name, as Lars uh, uh, pointed out, is Branko Petrovic, a Croatian architect uh, and uh, urban planner, uh, who did very interesting and cutting-edge uh, methodologies uh, uh, in a post-war uh, period in 50s actually in Croatia, but from 62 to 69 uh, he spent time in, in Ethiopia uh, because, you know, at, at that period uh, Yugoslavia was leader of non-aligned world, uh, a non-aligned block, if you like, the third block, not the west, not the east, but non-aligned. This non-aligned um, block geopolitical was geopo very heterogeneous geopolitical entity and there was like exchange between these non-aligned countries so he was one of the uh, Yugoslav experts working in Ethiopia and traveling around Africa uh, doing planning uh, uh, with local communities politicians and so on so this a very uh, mm, uh, decentralized I would say experience uh, of Africa and specifically Ethiopia at that time uh, influenced his his research, his planetary vision. So this planetary vision uh, did not came from the one dominant center, Western center, but from somewhere else, right? And um, uh, w once he was m uh, back to to Zagreb, he started working uh, on 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 the, this study. Uh, and his study was based on cybernetics, really uh, systemic thinking, systemic imagination of the world. But at the same time, he claimed that what we need today is uh, completeness and complexity, from material to immaterial, from physical to psychical, from function to abstraction, from present to futurological forms, from reality to fantasy and imagination. And this aspect of fantasy uh, and imagination, uh, abstraction and psychical levels of the, of the whole thing played really a seminal role uh, in, uh, in his work. This type of visuality we're talking about.
So we don't have, of course, time right now to dig deep into connections and layers of, of the diagram. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, uh, he connected um, uh, socio-economic system, uh, spatial system and the natural systems uh, with, uh, uh, with the uh, technological systems here. And here, and this is very important, he included uh, sensorial or uh, sensorial system, human perception. And that made a huge difference because when you include perception, when you activate human sensorium, the idea of humanity, this homogeneous, massive, robust idea of one world, one humanity decomposes and becomes, you know, humanity becomes one subject, one person. And that's a huge shift. And that person is called subject and is always in the very center of, of his diagrams. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, type of thinking, cybernetic thinking, was not, was not um, so common. Because unlike other cybernetic initiatives of the time, such as uh, the limits to growth and the World Tree model by Jay Forrester, that was published exactly uh, in the same time, uh, and it was impossible to you know, transfor uh, transform this type of uh, the systems and diagrams into algorithms, into mathematical algorithms. And when you're unable to do that, we're not talking about real cybernetics, you know. We're talking about something beyond that. We're talking about something that is uncalculable, something that operates through loose sense, something that is actually rough, unstable and rough. Technology, of course, in this overall systemic view had important, important uh, position. Uh, so this diagram shows the structure of techno environmental techno medium. Um, it's interesting because uh, there is uh, the upper part the, uh, is a per human perception, and this per uh, perception gives input uh, and is filtered uh, through technological development. So this is like a timeline of technological development. So the human perception changes uh, along with technological changes. Uh, this is mechanization, automatization, computerization, cybernetization, and, uh, and scientification. And right now, I mean, I find this very interesting because right now we are in this empty, uh, empty space. This is our current, you know, historical moment right now, me and you, you know, we are, we are there. Uh, that's interesting because this moment happened to be beyond not just cybernetization, but also beyond scientific reasoning. You know, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a space where truth, rational, uh, empirical, scientific truth became really a malleable matter. In this post-truth period, uh, we have to find new ways to operate and new ways to relate to technology. And imagination and art is extremely important for to do that. Uh, and this post-truth period, and when I'm saying post-truth period, I'm not talking just about you know Donald Trump politics or Bolsonaro politics. I'm also talking about uh, uh, the technology itself. Um, uh, you know, artificial intelligence as one of the most cutting edge. Uh, technologies and the most popular in, in in media technologies today became really you know enter this post truth post uh, scientific reasoning uh, era uh, there there was a article in science magazine last year claiming that artificial intelligence became uh, alchemy because you know when you're when it's impossible to reproduce your experiment because it became autonomous so the algorithm became autonomous then uh, it's not science anymore, you know. You cannot do, pub, you know, scientific publishing anymore, which <laughs> which means that instead of thinking it about it as science, we can approach it as alchemy. And in this situation, when there is no uh, strongholds, when there is no like, you know, tectonic pillars where we can uh, rely upon, uh, in the era of total uncertainty and millable truths, we really need a new type of uh, understanding and imagination of, uh, of and perception of both time and space to position ourselves. So. 
Petrovic in his diagrams work on this new perception of time and space, new imagination of time and space. Uh, in this vulvic shaped diagram, uh, he uh, uh, mashed six diagrams that I'm not going to show now, but they all deal with space, with different typologies of space. So he uh, mashed urban spaces, social spaces, closed and opened techno spaces with biological spaces, with atmosphere, with li lithosphere, with pedosphere, with bi uh, biosphere. Uh, and what binds everything together is a cosmos system or cosmosphere. So it was a cosmic, really a cosmic vision uh, that uh, mashed together biological realm, technological realm, and social realm. Uh, but it also uh, make, make me to think about movement through different scales and different spaces on everyday life, in everyday life. And this type of consciousness about different spaces that we inhabit on different scales also influences uh, our perception of time. Uh, this is one of the diagrams that discusses time. Uh, time not as a straight line or even worse as a, you know exponential line you know, in a capitalist economical progress. No, time is much more than that, you know. Time is heterogeneous, multiple mesh or uh, topology of different time curves, very different time curves. So this is biological time curve. This is calendar time curve. This is planner's time curve. This is technological time curve. This is historical. This is climatological time curve. This is social time curve. And this is incredible because, you know, we can really imagine, we can speculate uh, of inhabiting biological, for example, uh, time curve dominantly, not calendar or historical, but biological. And we can really start acting like bacteria, you know. We can, we can, we can really imagine how bacteria proliferate. We can change uh, uh, into into algae or or mushroom or slime mold. You know, we can really uh, think about different entities and how time is perceived from different perspectives, which are not necessarily human perspective. And of course, when that perception of time is mashed and intersected with social time or administrative bureaucratic time, new moments occur. And these moments, these points of, of intersections are actually changing the way how we think about things. You know, they change uh, uh, the notion of subjectivity and they're producing new subject. And this is the main point. So there is a new subject in the game, you know? And this new subject is called Homo effluvians. So Homo effluvians uh, is a hybrid entity. He's a man of the future. He's a human of toxic flow. Uh, he's survival of the techno-environmental catastrophe. He's hyper-adaptive uh, uh, entity. Uh, he has huge butt because he's sitting all the time. He ha he doesn't have any like muscles because like who needs muscles, you know? Like we are not going to lift anything, right? But we're gonna think. So he has huge head with huge brain inside to process all data. Um, he hu he has huge balls because of course he's semi-impotent because that reproduction is less important. You know, production is important. Um, and one of the most impressive things uh, is his forefinger, the so-called spatulative forefinger. Um, uh, Branko Petrovic described it as, uh, in, in these words, uh, so he said, uh, if you, uh, humans of the future will uh, have main preoccupation of clicking buttons. And I would add swiping screens. So this is like, a, this is a swiping finger. The whole study is uh, concluded with a note that it's just an abstract theoretical iteration, systemic iteration on the future of human environment and future of technology. 
But the real action, it, it's, it's supposed to serve as a, just as a layout for the real political and economic action that will happen the following year at the United Nations Conference in Stockholm. But unfortunately, due to uh, Branko's medical condition and also political situation around it, uh, uh, neither Branko or uh, Homo Fluvians uh, reached Stockholm. Instead, the book ended up in archives. In few, few copies of the book that were printed end up in archives. So, uh, my lecture today and also my work uh, in the uh, the exhibition is actually very site specific intervention it's a transhistoric capsule that uh, tends to speculate uh, about the shift necessary shift between ineffective policies to effective cosmopolitics and in plain words it asks question, what would happen and how our minds would look like if this type of visuality in 1972 in Stockholm looked like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to ask the panelists <laughs> come to the panel. I I'm sure that uh, sorry. You could um, later. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. well, I I'm sure you have questions for 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 Nicola based on his great presentation here, but please hold those questions for now. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask them later. Uh, right now, we are, uh, we're lucky to have some of the other artists and contributors to the exhibition present here, so this is also an occasion <coughs> to, uh, to hear it from themselves Thanks. about their works and projects in general and presentations in the exhibition. It's our opportunity to hear it from the horse's own mouth, as it were. <laughs> I'll, um, yeah, I've prepared some questions for the artists uh, about, their, um, about their practice in general, but also about specifically about their works. I'll, I'll try to keep um, uh, Nicola's discussion of futurology and the Petrovich material and the concepts that he narrated and dramatized this material with. I've, I'll try to keep that in in the mix, as uh, use them as kind of cues in this discussion, so so yeah, so this doesn't recede too far oh, in the background okay. over the next forty minutes or so. So, oh, okay. um, so so one key thing. I mean, one 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 Back. thing you have you've mentioned um, in the context of uh, of the Petrovich material here and the um, the futurology of the 1960s is that at this point in history, the future became a methodological issue. And I think that uh, that rhymes and resonates quite well with uh, some of your projects as well. And I think Anna, maybe we'll start with you because uh, you have a futurology of, of, of your own mm -hmm. uh, or you're, you're working with, uh, with reactivation of uh, a historical body of work as well. In this, in your case, it's experiments in art and, te art and technology, one of the canonical projects of the 60s where artists and engineers uh, met or were encouraged to collaborate. Could you talk about reactivation as, as a method? What is, uh, I mean, in, in our age of artistic intelligence and sophisticated algorithms and, you know, uh, global clouds and what have you. What what can uh, what can the reactivation of 50, 60 year old art historical material give us? Mm -hmm. in the well, yeah. So, oh, it's a big question, but um, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. But um, and and also, I I was just want to say that um, I want to talk to you uh, afterwards more. <laughs> it was very interesting um, and connected to a lot of the things. Mm. That 
person working with as well. Uh, but but yeah, so mm, so w this project that you're referring to is um, was sort of a yeah a reactivation or reconsideration, I guess, of of a of a festival and congress with maybe an emphasis on congress, as it turned out, that took place in uh, Stockholm in 1966, um, called Visioner av Nuet, uh, which visions of the present, which is sort of a bit backwards, I guess, or it's this title is quite intriguing, sort of how to see the future or the present. What a vision is usually something about the future, but is it also about trying to see your own time? And, and so this, um, yeah, play with temporalities was sort of in it from the start. And this, this is really kind of the prehistory of EAT that you mentioned. So this this festival was was interesting to me because they wanted to really get a, to the core of how uh, how are we going to change? How is humanity going to change? How is society going to be impacted by technological development? And there was this huge um, yeah the government had just invested huge amounts of money into uh, scientific research and technological kind of, yeah, research. Um, and so they thought, actually scientists also agreed like, okay, but who's gonna keep an eye on this development and how are we, that will, this will inevitably change our environment and the way that we perceive reality, but who's gonna kind of, keep an eye on that, who will express these changes. And so they really felt that artists should be involved in this. Um, anyway, so I thought those were kind of, like artists were really hailed up as this sort of very important force. And also what I got interested in about this project was, I mean, I don't know exactly what they meant by technology at the time. I mean, I think it it's not possible to read that without knowing what we know now, but since the word is so open, like technology, you can read into it what you want. Uh, and I think that made it sort of possible to, to reactivate a bit of this material. You could kind of cut some parts out and drop it into the present and see what happens if we, if we ask similar questions that they were asking, but they asked them too early, they didn't know what they were talking about. But now I think the sort of otherness of technology has sort of disappeared um, and it's way more entangled and now is maybe the time to, yeah, have, have well, to, uh, you know, when you're uh, in your house and you're home blind to it or no. I, you, I know I've been trying to, this term doesn't exist in English, but I oh, keep saying home it. Home blindness. It's, home it's blindness. It's a translation of a good Swedish it's a well, Swedish yeah. word, um, hemma blin, um, where you can't see your own surroundings and maybe you can't see your own time either. And particularly in terms of technology, we're so invested and entangled in it. Mm. So it was this way of, the focus isn't so much on the past as it is trying to, yeah, get get some something to rub up against. Yeah. So speaking of, yeah, great, thank you. Um, sp speaking of of dropping things in the f in the future, uh, you know, <laughs> your 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 work for the exhibition is uh, consists in a series of uh, of lava lamps casting glass in your own likeness. So they're self portraits as lava lamps. The movement of the lava or the colored goo inside uh, the lamps is red. Uh, in real time by a camera that feeds the movements of the goo to a machine learning program that has been, been programmed with the I Ching, the book of transformations that then produce divinations and aphorisms. Um, you'll see for yourself when you go to the space. <laughs> <laughs> um, why on earth reactivate the lava lamp? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, actually, um, the I, I Ching is more a reference in this case, the, uh, because it, uh, the binary code, Black Leibniz's binary code, has its origins in in I Ching, and uh, what it actually the there's like a 
machine learning system that's been uh, taught with um, sacred texts, so folkloric, mystical texts from uh, from over the years, as well as um, error with trip reports. So the predictions or the divination it uh, divinations it it produces are based on these learning materials. But um, I thought that it's uh, it's an apt time to uh, bring back the uh, that this original psychedelic technology <laughs> uh, and and kind of considering that these deep dreaming artificial neural networks provide the more kind of contemporary image of the thing in, thing in itself uh, right now uh, and and sort of combining these two two things uh, together having the the neural network um, in the app part of the work um, so it's a two part work there are the the lava lamps as you mentioned and and also a mobile app producing divinations based on their movements so so yeah it felt felt like the right right time <laughs> to to do this and also the the heads have a reference point so so there's also this history in computing and and lava lamps uh so in silicon graphics in the 90s uh lava lamps were used as a random number generator um and uh, like uh, in a way any any sort of living or material or chemical reaction or anything beyond the computer would have produced more random numbers than the <coughs> computer itself um but uh, but it was this kind of um iconic <laughs> technology that was used used for that and now based on that reference uh, a wall of lava lamps called wall of entropy is used uh, in san francisco at this um, um, web encryption company um, as uh, to produce random numbers but in the case of my work i'm actually uh, uh, looking for patterns or signs meaning <laughs> in the, the the blobs of liquid <laughs> um and color. Uh so so yes the, the app is sort of reading the uh, like in ceromancy or divining from wax it's reading these um shapes that are formed uh in the lava lamps. <laughs> yeah, great. I was I mean um Nicola I I don't remember if you actually used the term at all but uh, the word utopia, if you mentioned that. I mean, you, you did talk about the big modern projects or the, the big governmental projects of late modernity. Um, but I don't think you mentioned the word utopia. And that, that's, and, 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 and you know, that's uh, for the era that was very commonly used, obviously, when you thought about the future. Uh, so I was thinking, Ravi, um, uh, Ravi represents Cos Group here. Um, and cost groups work deals to to put it very briefly uh, deals with um, uh, resource scarcity and infrastructural breakdown in uh, present day Johannesburg. But there is a utopian component in uh, in your video installation. Uh, the the video in the installation is in three acts, and the third act deals with uh, radical social models. Uh, you, you, you yourself has, uh, have used the term utopia about these social models. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a quite grim everyday reality that you take as your point of departure, but, but still uh, uh, you talk about utopia. Is, is there a... Why, yeah, why, why utopia still? Is there... Yeah. Um, I guess it looks at as you say, the actual grim realities um, that are at play within South Africa and specifically Johannesburg in relation to our project. Um, and it speculates on radical social models that definitely feel utopian, but could actually have been implemented by um, from like a governmental standpoint could have been implemented to, I guess, create change, um, to break lines of division within society. Um, and I guess that definitely relates to looking back at the histories of South Africa and um, where South Africa has come from 
um, an extremely segregated uh, space to one that offered hope to many people. Uh, and what you see, and I guess loosely what our work, sort of one of the like, starting points of the work was to look at technology um, as enacting um, or continued, continuing the enactment of like uh, minority power. Um, yeah, and I guess how Utopia loosely fitted in to that question and uh, our work was the speculation on um, social housing models that were possible to implement but um, were not, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. So utopia is still necessary to have with us in a certain sense? Definitely, and it shouldn't feel unrealistic, I guess. I, I, that's the context in which we sort of define what utopia is. Right. Thank you. Um, I mean, if the modern era couldn't do without utopia, then we can't do without technological development today. That's one of the, the mantras. When we think about technology, it often goes with the qualifier development. And I think that's that's a question for, for you, Bjarke, and, and the artist group Primer, <coughs> whom you represent, uh, just by way of very brief introduction. Uh, Primer has a very has a special, unique arrangement with a corporation called Aquaporin, uh, and a corporation in Copenhagen. Primer have their office, <laughs> I should say. They, they Primer are based at Aquaporin. Aquaporin deals with uh, synthetic biology. They have uh, patented uh, a synthetic protein that purifies water. So a patent with, yeah, uh, with huge potential, basically. Uh, Aquaporin uh, believe it's interesting to be in dialogue with artists and with artistic thinking, hence Primer's presence at uh, the factory, at the corporation. Uh, Primer, one of, <coughs> sorry, one of Primer's main activities at Aquaporin is to curate exhibitions with other artists and to organize discursive events. Uh, so it's possible to visit Aquaporin and to, um, yeah, uh, to, to see the exhibitions and to see the, the factory at the same time. And to visit Aquaporin is, apart from the fact that you can see great exhibitions, <laughs> it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, extraordinary because it's, a very, it's, it's like having a window onto the future thrown open. Uh, you, have, um, you have research in, synth in synthetic biology taking place there, you have research and development, you have uh, actual manufacture of these membranes that purify water. Um, Primer's presentation here at, uh, at Mod Muses uh, is, I guess it can be called a meditation on technological development. <laughs> would, that be, would that be correct? Yeah, sure, that's one way of putting it. Um, I think maybe one thing that's quite important to say in relation to our contribution is that um, it's both an installation, you could call it, or like a mini exhibition within the exhibition, uh, which is up in Mars Muses, but it's also an event in January, which is, you could say, both a public event, but as much an eternal event that's about uh, kind of cultivating or developing conversations between a number of actors who are working in this field between art and technology, but maybe don't have the specific uh, infrastructure or um, network ca um, de developed enough to actually um, maybe move beyond the possibilities that are there right now. And I think Primer is one, one thing that's quite important with Primer is that it's a project that's um, in the same way it's about techno technological development, it's also about some kind of artistic development in relation to how can art actually engage with technology in new ways on different ways? And um, just briefly, the installation in the Mud Muses is um, exhibits a machine that was used by Aquaporin from 2013 to 2016 uh, in their research and development. So in a way, it's uh, now it's defunct or it has already uh, played out its use because it's, uh, it was used in developing a specific 
part of their technology, and then when that's finished, the machine is kind of left over to kind of ruin or shed skin or something like this. So in a way, what is in the exhibition is a remnant of technolo technological development. And um, you could say one of the other works that's uh, part of the installation is um, a work by Emil Ron Andersen, um, who's an artist who's working at Primer for, he started a couple of weeks ago, and he's working there uh, for the next four months. And what, he, what he's uh, developing is a kind of a lighting technology used in uh, photography uh, that is both uh, artistic work and a patented technology that can be used for, for example, commercial pr uh, purposes. Um, and he's developing a prototype, I think it's the fifth or fourth or fifth prototype uh, of this technology at Primer for the next four months. So in a way it's both, you could say it's kind of like a residency, it's also a little bit of an exhibition, but it's also just having a a development of a technology that's also an artistic technology in a way um, uh, that's occurring simultaneously with the synthetic biology development that's going on at Aquaporn. Um, why, why was it? Bit off maybe, but no, 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 no. It's yeah. great. But I was, I was wondering why, why was it important to you to have this um, dead industrial prototype in the exhibition in relation to discussions of technological development. Um, what are you thinking about? Oh, the uh, why, why, why introduce the uh, the um, uh, the machine, the, uh, the the inoperative machine? Right. Well, I uh. think I mean for we were talking a lot because we 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 never. This is like the first time we did um, something in a museum or an art institution this way, and that's that's something. The most important thing I think about how we relate to technology is in the processual element. So. I think maybe the exhibition is one way of dealing with that, which is in a symbolic way. Um, and another thing that we're really trying to kind of pioneer or experiment with is having more close dialogue with the company and the kind of, you could say, the technological field that they're working in and thinking about how can art actually step into that, uh, that practice in new ways that would be something like actually being part of what you could call like a public-private partnership where you have uh, governments, municipalities, companies, uh, non-governmental organizations working together with a, some maybe a huge EU grant for example, working together with um, about a specific issue related to water for example. How could art actually be part of that process? So you start thinking about a process, uh, a kind of place for art that's very, very different from where art is positioned today in uh, society where it goes to the museum and then it's there. So it's some, it's a kind of thing about art where it's, um, it's in a very processual state together with the, tech, uh, with, the, with the technology that's developed. And in a way, you could say in a symbolic, kind of simple symbolic way, having a machine that's not uh, a finished article and it's not something that's, um, it's not like a pristine technology that's working and it's uh, presented to the world. It's actually just something that's been used in technological process. And it's, it was about this machine that you see up there was about to be scrapped. It was about to be thrown out and just sold off in parts, you know. So it's this kind of, uh, yeah, it's just to, to highlight that kind of aspect in a way. Mm, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> in uh, Nicola's presentation, we saw the striking image of Homo effluvians in all his productivist spatula fingered glory, uh, and it's a quite, <laughs> it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a striking image of the meeting between uh, the human subject and the machine and the material world. Um, Gediminas, uh, in the project you're presenting, uh, the mushroom power plant, which. Uh, is a, is a project you're uh, you're creating together with uh, with Nomeda, um, your your art and and life partner. Um, uh, the mushroom power plant is uh, one manifestation of uh, year-long interest in um, in in mushrooms and fungi <laughs> and. Um, and and their and their possibilities in design and architecture and art and also uh, technology 
so the mushroom power plant in the exhibition is a model for a prototype of a mushroom battery. Uh, now, <laughs> homo effluvians and the human figure and the human subject, you have coined the term energy humanities in connection with your research on, uh, on mushrooms and mushroom energy. I was wondering, I mean, this, this is, you, you, you have always, Nomeda and yourself have always worked in a, in a sort of, in a profoundly, profoundly interdisciplinary way. Uh, and here, in this case, you've worked with researchers from the universities of Kaunas in Lithuania and Kent in England. Um, but why is, it, why, why is it necessary to you, or why is it relevant to you to insist on, um, on the humanities here as uh, the disciplinary home for this research? And could you briefly explain what you mean by energy humanities? Okay, thank you, Lars, so, for your... So, sorry, yeah. big questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of... Uh, perhaps I will start from the other end, you know. Yesterday, I just learned a Swedish word called swamp. Uh, and uh, and I love I love this play of words swamp and swamp, uh, English and uh, and the uh, uh, Swedish versions right the swamp and the and the mushroom. Um, uh, well, disclaimer: energy humanities is not my term. Uh, oh. It's actually uh, uh, Imre Zeman, who is a can, uh, Canadian scientist. Uh, he published this anthology uh, together. Uh, uh, with another scholar, uh, Boyer, uh, under this title, Energy Humanities, uh, uh, trying to sort of like describe the territory, emerging territory that is similar in medical humanities or digital humanities. Uh, looks at kind of like uh, larger territory of, uh, of humanities to sort of like bring them to the um, really crucial question of uh, climate change and also imagining the energy transition and imagining life in so-called post-fossil uh, fuel uh, era. Um, so, um, so within that discourse for us it is interesting to bring uh, fiction uh, into the play, um, um, uh, not as a way to completely retreat from the, from the pressing concerns, but precisely um, uh, from the desire to create new hybrids. You know, when you bring the fiction and you bring the sort of like pre pressing concerns, you, know, you could potentially create uh, new hybrids. Um, and uh, we had this uh, 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 long-term interest in the swamps and, uh, and also in the swamps, in the, in the mushrooms. Uh, and, um, um, and it's all started actually uh, with Nomeda reading uh, uh, one Japanese scholarly uh, uh, publication uh, on how the carbonized mushrooms could potentially uh, replace the graphite and the graphene in the lithium-ion batteries. And as we know, the lithium-ion batteries is, uh, is really a big uh, pressing question, right? Uh, that's why uh, a few days ago, uh, perhaps also the Nobel Prize uh, for Chemistry was given to the people uh, researching the lithium-ion batteries. Um, but, uh, but we sort of like try to pose this question uh, uh, to the scientists in involving, as you mentioned, the two teams of scientists, one working uh, with the uh, bacteria energy, bacteria that lives in the swamps, bacteria that lives in the um, uh, in the mud, uh, and uh, which is known as geobacter, um, and uh, and people working uh, with mushrooms and also with batteries. So we put we put these teams together. Uh, so it started sort of like uh, as the um, some kind of like um, speculative proposition, uh, but uh, it ended as the as a real prototype, which was tested. Uh, um, at least 100 times uh, before it acquires its sort of like public, public presence. So yeah, so that's, well, the energy, uh, uh, sort of like our contribution to energy uh, humanities was sort of like imagining, um, um, imagining how through the kind of like fictional uh, and uh, an artistic proposition, you know, we could, uh, we could sort of like create uh, um, alternative. 
some kind of alternative Hindu scientific research, or some kind of like hybrid, what we call hybrid. Mm. And, uh, and this idea, uh, of course, it is inspired by the observation uh, of uh, so-called uh, um, symbi uh, uh, symbiotic relations. Um, uh, and as we know that the mushrooms uh, have that characteristic of creating new hybrids, uh, like, for example, if you look at uh, lichens, right? They are, they are a result of the symbiotic relationship or mutualism, one of the kinds of symbiotic relationships, like when, uh, when the algae uh, and the bacteria and the fungi collaborate together in, pro in production of this new hybrid, like a lichen. So, um, so in that sense, uh, we're interested in sort of like bringing uh, uh, some of the... Um, uh, methods or thinking patterns from the artistic intelligence and from other fields uh, in humanities mm -hmm. and merging that with, with, with science. Yeah, I mean, on, on that note, uh, other fields, uh, it's not so apparent in this project of yours, but uh, you, have, you have earlier, in earlier manifestations of your mushroom research, you've made uh, sort of very explicit reference to science fiction literature the Strugatsky brothers or J.G. Ballard, for instance, how does that factor into your, to, to your artistic intelligence, science fiction? Right, no, S uh, Strugatsky, well, especially as um, 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 it has uh, um, also along uh, Ballard um, and, um, um, and other um, fiction writers, uh, what was perhaps interesting, you know, for us to really observe uh, how uh, some of this fiction, uh, um, on one hand, uh, has the ability to propose future uh, scenarios, kind of like for future imagination, and this is something what we've been observing for the last ten years, uh, being based at MIT, um, and looking especially uh, um, at different <coughs> research groups, but but perhaps uh, specifically at the media lab, you know, how this. Uh, so the like future-looking scenarios uh, inspire um, technologies. Uh, but perhaps, you know, for us, uh, it is really interesting this question of hybridity, hybrid practice, and, uh, and the ability of, of fiction to um, um, not necessarily inspire kind of like techno-optimist scenarios, but precisely to destabilize scientific logic. Um, um, logic that is... Uh, typically and characteristically driven to bettering of the world, right? So we want to suspend this kind of like idea of bettering the world and, uh, um, and create perhaps uh, spaces for, um, um, for the new imagination, for you know, what we're calling the changing habits of thought, uh, for, for something that could uh, perhaps, uh, um, well, propose uh, scenarios uh, um, beyond the human, if that is possible. Great, thank you. Um, in, his, in his aesthetic theory, Adorno talks about the latent co collectivity of the artwork. Um, and I guess by that he means that the authored subjectivity of the artwork tends to obscure the collective underpinnings of the art concept. In... Uh, when artists deal with technology, this latent collectivity of the artwork tends not to be so latent. It's actually quite manifest. Uh, and that's the case when, uh, when artists collaborate, as many of you do, Primer, Cos Group, Numida and Gediminas. Um, and um, I mean, that, that is in itself a big discussion, but uh, maybe to ask Anna, because this also goes to... Uh, it, it goes to the, to the origins of uh, discussions of art and technology in the 60s and yeah, experiments in art and technology again. Um, and you yourself in the performances that you will do during the, uh, the exhibition, you will collaborate with, uh, or it's based on collaborations with Julie Martin, mm. for instance. Uh, could you, why was it important to them in the 60s to have collaborations between artists and engineers? Uh, and why, how, how, how do you work, how do you work with that? Yeah, um, well, so I think, so the research that I've been doing into this sort of very specific period uh, in history sort of 
the spring of 1966 <laughs> only, no. Uh, but it, so much kind of was happening at that particular time when they were really trying to plan this festival that was planned to be in Stockholm and, and happen, but kind of without a lot of the American artists who had been working with engineers more um, on one-to-one -one, uh, collaborations at Bell Labs, which later became the Nine Evenings and EAT, etc. Um, was that... So, so the Swedish initiators from Filkingen and the American side were really trying to kind of tease out these ideas um, during that spring. Uh, and I'm interested in those sort of early... Um, yeah, ideas about how and why uh, these sorts of uh, collaboration should sh collaborations should exist in the first place, and and I think one view was what I was talking about before that the artist was sort of seen as um, someone who could offer a mirror uh, almost uh, to what was going on in society, but in order to do that they also needed access to the latest technology because in in one view was that mm, it's really kind of that idea of me media, the media is the message kind of, you can't talk about technology if you're not yourself engaged in it. Um, and the other viewpoint, maybe more Billy Kluver's and later EAT's viewpoint was that, as I understand it, was that they really had this idea that technology would develop based on engineers' uh, way of thinking and um, a very sort of rational and, and um, kind of more and more removed from the human life and the human sort of what do we really want, like what's what they were really into sort of, but how can we ensure that technology is developed not just for the means of society or like, yeah, capitalist, I guess, means, but, but for pleasure and for the human being. And so they, he thought, probably based on his own experiences with working with artists, that he had changed his way of thinking by working with artists. So, no, so he wanted, he saw it as a big project to try to have these collaborations happen so that that in turn would, the artist's way of thinking maybe or doing things would, alter the engineer's way of thinking, and then that would maybe in turn change how technology would be developed. It was a very sort of utopian idea of how that would change things. That's how I understand that. But um, in my case, I think, mm, I mean, as artists, I think we collaborate in, in different ways. I mean, some of you, we talked about this the other day, how, I mean, some of you have these collectives that the, that I'm super jealous of, it sounds so nice <laughs> um, to have like a yeah, continuous conversation with someone. But I tend to find sort of new collaborations uh, for each project. Um, right now I'm working with both like a retired engineer from Televerket, like the telephone company who we we're trying to like wake up the very first um, technology that enabled I guess it was a precursor of the, our digital assistants, like Miss Clock, if you know the Um And so I'm working with an old engineer who is retired, but I'm also working with this uh, genius hacker who's helping me um, make another kind of embodied enactment of this technology um, function in real time and with video and stuff. So it's this, I, you know, you find your, I think, the way I work is that I find my collaborators along the way. But with the, the project that relates to EAT, for me, that was a completely different way of collaboration. It was, I decided that in order to investigate what these visions would be now or how we would think about these things, I needed help, really, and I wanted more voices to help me think about this. So I th thought, I have to do a new mm. festival without understanding the level of work that that was about, but uh, but it was <laughs> this, <laughs> like, if they, those dudes could do it, I can do it too, so I, yeah. But that was a more sort of, yeah, bringing in uh, more, more perspectives and voices 
uh, onto something. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that was an answer. It was. <laughs> yeah. Definitely was. And my voice is uh, <coughs> <Yeah>. done. <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, I can see that I, we won't have time for me to ask all of the questions that I prepared. I think, mm. but, uh, uh, and we and we should definitely get Nicola back on the on the panel as well. Just one uh, one last question to Ravi. Um, apropos of um, those um, cartographies of the world in a time of crisis that. Uh, that Nicola talked about as well, and that we saw in the Petrovic diagrams. A cost groups installation in the exhibition is one of the most sort of directly crisis-oriented uh, contributions to the show, I think. And uh, cartography, I think, or sort of cognitive mapping of the urban fabric also plays around uh, a role, sorry, in your work. Uh, in a in a special way, because the uh, the central figure in your installation is uh, what in Suli is called Ichinyogi, snake men. And the snake men are um, uh, people who operate um, in um, in Johannesburg when the uh, when when the power grid breaks down, the snake men hook up. Uh, they yeah, they hook up to they they tap power off of uh, the city's power grid. Uh, so you get this sort of cable spaghetti with these uh, illegal plugins, basically. Uh, and the people who do so, which is a, yeah, a dangerous practice, obviously, they are called snake men. Uh, so, so the snake men are part of everyday mythology in, uh, in Johannesburg. So they are part of the, of, of the mapping, of the cognitive mapping of the urban space. At the same time, you have people in the video, uh, in your video installation, uh, talking about um, activism, about their uh, disillusionment with uh, with the, the city of Johannesburg and uh, and how it has failed uh, citizens. So there is there is an aspect of of civil unrest and activism as well. So so somewhere between, you know. Uh, cartography and mythology, everyday mythology, and uh, activism, power lies. Um, can it's a very open-ended <laughs> question. This I realize, but can you talk a bit about this? I mean, I yes. think um, to firstly start off talking about the cartographies um, aspect. Uh, that's definitely like the literal sort of translation with the work would be like the urban planning um, of South Africa, but also like specifically Johannesburg, of course. Um, and how urban planning can have such a exclusionary effect on society. Um, and uh, the major thing with how that relates to like the social housing sort of policies was the creation of these sort of peri-urban spaces um, that just pushed people away from the city center. And um, those areas also didn't have um, public transport channels um, as means for people to sort of access the city center, access a job market, be included in daily life. Um, there's a sense of time passing when you're like living in this world, which is like a zone um, and you cannot be part of society. And that's what some of the people speak about in the video. Um, to respond to the snake men, uh, that's, the, the term was actually coined by people living in these areas and yeah, informal settlements to describe the way the electrical cables snaked on the ground, actually. Um, and the Zulu word for snake is izinyoka. So they would actually call the cables on the ground izinyoga and yoga. And the government with various sort of advertising agencies involved 
de uh, like co-opted this term um, using the sort of Zulu mythologies to demonize the people working in the communities to provide electricity to the disenfranchised or the repressed. So the Izinyoka became popularly understood as the snake man, this um, black man in a trench, matrix-like trench coat, uh, working at night to steal from the nation. And then, in turn, further put lives at risk by running ele live electrical wires like across roads or like there was this famous advert on South African national TV, uh, which is on YouTube, uh, where you see these scenarios played out because of the illicit actions of the Izinyoka. And they take on this sort of uh, reptilian quality too in the advert, which you also see in the video that we've done. <coughs> um, and there was one more aspect to this. The oh, civil unrest. Civil unrest, which, yeah, of course, service delivery. Um, people waiting on services, waiting on housing, waiting on basic infrastructure and technologies, which are never provided to them. And uh, in every four years, at the end of every electoral or towards the new electoral cycle, the government steps into these like communities to provide like three months of electrical access. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, we should definitely get you back in the game now. <laughs> um, should we? I think we should open the floor to questions. Actually, at this stage, um, maybe as we just yeah if. if A first one, Nicola, to you, just to... Um, you left off by talking about an effective cosmopolitics, uh, that this, the history that the Petrovich diagrams are part of, and that they represent, that that can help us define an effective cosmopolitics. Can you talk a little bit more about that? <coughs> well, the, the way how I, I understand uh, Cosmopol effective cosmopolitics is the uh, finding new ways to 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 plug in really human sensorium uh, on everyday level on the different scales uh, that we live in and we are not aware of it you know like we we live uh, our daily routines by not being aware of um, scales that <laughs> that we go through you know from from datascapes to infrastructures to biological pedos you know uh, cosmo uh, bio uh, biosphere to to uh, pedosphere lithosphere and everything is actually mixed up on several scales and levels and we are we are in touch with with this type of very complex environment and we are not aware of it and we are influencing uh, that this environment through technology uh, by not being aware of it at all. So uh, finding ways to activate uh, awareness about these different scales and the uh, like highest scale is actually this cosmic scale uh, is uh, impossible uh, to do. Is that's impossible task uh, because <laughs> our everyday experience is so, you know, focused to everyday uh, procedures, right? And really disturbing this type of everydayness uh, and as Gediminas would say, ways of thinking, to intervene in ways of thinking uh, through sensorium, because that's the most effective, not effective, but effective way of doing it, is the only way to, you know, to get in touch and to be aware of this very interscalar reality that we are uh, actively existing in. Any questions to any of us? Or maybe you want to go and see the show?
So thank you, thank you. So I'm just gonna ask a yes or no question. <laughs> um, so like, with all your guys' progression with your companies and stuff, I was wondering if like progression in your guys' mind ever involved like looking back like farther than the 70s in the technological innovations. I mean, like, modern technological innovations. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Affirmative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, for, I think maybe, maybe sorry to, <laughs> to answer with more than one word. Um, I see it's, uh, I, you, you will see in the, in the exhibition some media archaeologies that, uh, that go further back than, than the 70s and the 60s that we've talked so much about tonight. Uh, in the work of Lucy Liu, there is, uh, she's developing um, a formal history, a formal, yeah, a formal history of the digital cloud, as we know it, through art history. Uh, and that is a history that she takes back uh, through, you know, uh, artists such as Cosens or Constable and other 19th century cloud painters. She takes it back to Brunelleschi and, uh, you know, the, uh, the invention of central <coughs> perspective. Um, so that is, uh, we, that's, uh, that's the, that's sort of the range of, uh, of one of the media archaeologies in the exhibition. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I wanted to ask Anna uh, about, uh, you mentioned uh, that the role of the artist in that science artist collaboration in the 60s was sort of uh, being a witness or sort of representing what was going on, what was mm -hmm. happening. And I was wondering if you as, an, as a researcher also could say something. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you could say something about the role now as a researcher also with the relationship between artistic research and uh, scientific research now when, when art maybe has a different um, position also in the knowledge mm. production or, or sort of the mode of knowing and doing and, yeah, the, ro and the relationship between scientists and artists through that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's. It sounds really good that they had all this, you know, belief in what art an artist could could do, or what role artists could have in society. Um, but of course, there's also this sort of risk in hoping for that much kind of use value of an artist in a sense, um, because it can easily become almost sort of how to value an artwork would be then how it could, what it could sort of accomplish in some other field or, um, so that of course is kind of a danger and I'm, I think also artistic research can ha have the same kind of danger in, in trying to exist not on arts terms, but um, yeah, I, I'm trying to really see artistic research and as it's as a really valid um, field in its own right or that art in its own right can have any kind of impact but it doesn't have to be so specific as perhaps they were describing it as at the time um, yeah is that an answer yeah Other questions? <coughs> Otherwise, we can uh, can also call it a night um, and go to see the exhibition. But on that note, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Thanks for your wonderful lecture, Nicola. And thanks for coming. <laughs>